Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. So yes, if you didn't catch our previous video, we recently had a very short announcement uh, that we are actually applying for Canadian PR. All right, and in part of that video. We also said that, you know, we know we have a lot of people who ask us a lot of questions. We get a lot of messages on our Instagram, on our Facebook, which by the way, uh, it would be great if you follow us there. We'll put the link here. Um, but yeah, so we do get a lot of questions regarding Canadian PR, but not just that, but how we are doing here, like what's the cost of living, uh, a whole bunch of different questions. So we thought, you know what, we're going to compile them in a single video because I mean, we have a lot of people asking the same question. So we've sort of compiled the top maybe 10 or 11 questions that we get frequently asked. Uh, and, you know, so we hope we can answer that. But at the same time, we are not really a, a Canadian immigration channel. We're not experts. So yeah. <laughs> this is no, based from our experience. Yeah. Honestly, when we created this channel, it was more about just wanting to document our entire journey. Yes. So we've got something to look back on. Um, but honestly, if you're looking for very detailed, different immigration routes and the methods and how you can go in uh, or come into Canada, um, I would say, I mean, when we first or before we first moved, we looked at a lot of different channels and the best channel, which had the most info um, and the most up to date info as well at that, uh, time. At that time. And even now, uh, every time there's a new pathway or anything. Uh, this channel has a new video almost instantly. Uh, and that's ZT Canada, all right? So his name is Zit. He has fantastic videos. Uh, the funny thing was that uh, we actually became friends. So I contacted him on, on, on YouTube. It's just so that we have a channel. I've got another tech review channel and we happen to be in the same group uh, of, of uh, you know, YouTubers on Facebook and we became friends. Um, and he's been giving, uh, he's been so helpful, giving us a lot of information. Uh, and so if you're looking for that kind of information, how to come into Canada, what are the different routes you can take, uh, he would be the number one channel. Okay, so on to the Q&A. Now, this might be a long video, so bear with us. So what I'll do is every question that we address, uh, I'm going to break them up into chapters. So the, look down in the video description, see which question you want to uh, look at or you want the answer to, uh, and you can skip to that. Now, G hasn't actually seen the questions yes, yet. It's going to be a surprise. Yep. So I have them listed down um, and I'm going to list them down. There's no particular order. Uh, it's just which one I think is the most common questions that we get. Right. So the first one that we have uh, asked by a lot of people, which is where are you guys from? So I'll let G answer first. I am from the Philippines. I grew up and studied in the Philippines, but I moved to Singapore in 2010. And since then, I've been living there before coming here to Canada. Yeah. So that was, we moved in June 2021, if yeah. you guys aren't aware. Last and year. we've had a lot of other videos as well. So go check that out. Uh, for me, uh, I'm from Singapore, born and bred. Uh, never really left the country for any other <laughs> thing other than a holiday. Um, this my first major move for G. It's her second, second major move. Yeah, but I'm from Singapore. G is from the Philippines. All right. So second question. Now, why did you choose? Uh, we we get two main questions. Some is why did I? Why did we choose Canada? Why did we choose Calgary? So we're gonna lump them into the same question. Now, before we sort of give a more summarized version, we did address this in I think our first or second video in our channel. Uh, so if you want a more de detailed um explanation of why we chose Canada. Uh, go check that out. I'll put a link to that as well uh, in the video description below. But I think we actually had, uh, we'll be honest, Canada wasn't our first choice. It was yeah. not. It was not. Yeah. So why Canada? Well, like what James said, this was not our first um, first option. At first, we wanted to go to Australia because uh, I have a sister there. So it would be nice to have a family, you know, member um, in the same country. But um, it was a bit difficult for us to go there because of uh, a lot of reasons. So Canada was suggested to us and we looked at it. We look, we searched online on like the good things about living in Canada. Yeah. So like, like, like G said, we, our first choice was Australia. For me, it was either Australia or New Zealand. Um, but yeah, be, mostly because of location. And I think this applies to a lot of people who are looking to move. Uh, overseas from their country if you're in Asia um, but yeah it's you're still pretty near um, your home country if especially if you're in Southeast Asia uh, Philippines Singapore Australia is still very near uh, will be very near to our friends and family so that was our that's one of the main reasons why we wanted to move but um, yeah like 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 G said for a number of reasons including age it was pretty difficult uh, despite the fact that G has a sister who's already a citizen that's how hard it is to get into Australia right now um, but yeah so the immigration agency that we spoke to 
mentioned Canada and said, you know what, Canada might be a good option. So we did some research um, and we thought, yeah, it might be a, a good option. Um, there were a number of reasons as well why we picked Calgary specifically. Mm -hmm. So now we decided, okay, maybe Canada. So there are more common or the more uh, common places that people will go to uh, from Asia, which is obviously BC or Ontario. Um, the reason why we picked Calgary, one of the main reasons is that we felt that in terms of cost of living, uh, it might be the best place to settle down. Mm -hmm. So it, it had a good balance of uh, lower cost of living plus uh, being a pretty good and developed and mm -hmm. relatively new city. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Calgary has... At that time, the highest um, minimum wage, I don't know if that still applies, mm -hmm. um, but also like it's still accessible. It's still a beautiful city. It's not like uh, really rural or mm -hmm. you're going to miss out on a lot of things. You're not at all. Um, yeah. And we were worried about like, you know, how are we going to find our food? But, you know, tell me about what we found in terms of groceries. Oh, we <laughs> found a lot of... Um stores that sell Asian food, uh, Filipino food, Singaporean food, Malaysian food. And some of them are are um, supplies that I couldn't even find in Singapore <laughs> or the, even the, in Manila. The jute leaves, right? Yeah, yeah. so there was a, leaf, uh, a vegetable called saluyot that I couldn't find sometimes even in Manila and in Singapore. And here I found it here. Yes. Um, and also another thing I think uh, that we wanted to mention about why we chose Calgary is that over Toronto and Vancouver is that Toronto and Vancouver are big cities. And of course, when it comes to big cities, there's a lot of opportunities there. But at the same time, you know, it's very populated. It's densely populated. And for us, like, we came from Singapore and Manila, and those are densely populated cities. So we wanted somewhere where it's in the middle, like what's J what James said. So like, we want a city, but also near to the mountains, near to yes. nature. So we thought that Calgary would give us that. And yeah, and it 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 did. It yeah. gave us no that. No regrets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, next one. So, um, and this is a pretty specific one. How much did it cost to ship our stuff over from Singapore? Yes. So, um, yeah. So I think this is a very relative uh Question. So for us, we had to ship um, quite a lot of stuff. Um, like what James said, he has another um, YouTube channel. And because of that, there are a lot of equipment that he needs to bring over. So um, because of, of sponsorships and working with other um, companies. So yeah, it whole, was a, whole, a basically lot of stuff. a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> so yeah, most of the stuff was actually mine, but of course, uh, one thing about when you ship over, weight doesn't really matter as much uh, if you're familiar with moving stuff or if you've moved uh, places before. Uh, it's more about how much space you take up in a container. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. some people actually uh, buy an entire container space and they just mm -hmm. put whatever they want. It doesn't matter how heavy it is. So for us, um, we dismantled like the tables and, mm -hmm. and chairs that, 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 that G mentioned that we brought over, even my, my computer monitors. Um, the desktop, I brought it over. Uh, without the case so it was just a components everything was in a gigantic box um, for us it came up to about three and a half thousand three, yeah, now three. by Singapore standards that's actually pretty good now what we did was I contacted a lot of movers who are based in Singapore um, and we generally got quotes that were about double right six seven thousand Singapore dollars um, and yeah so we were lucky we found uh, a Unconventional, I would say, uh, way to move. It yeah, it, it's a moving company that usually um, it's logistics. I think because um, their main business is shipping like <laughs> cargos or shipping boxes. I mean, for Filipinos, you know, balik bayan box. So that's their main business. But they also do customized shipping. So that's what they did for us. Yeah. So basically, already using their network, or moving up and down just put our stuff together. So we got about three and a half thousand. Now, mm -hmm. my understanding is um, moving stuff out of Singapore is generally very expensive. So if you're moving from a different country, it's probably going to be cheaper. I can't really say for sure. I don't know. Yeah. And if, okay, if you're watching this and you're from Singapore, there are a few options. Like obviously you have the, the, the most stress-free version if you just hire an international mover to take care of everything. They even pack everything for you. Um, you can do what we did where we handled all the packing and we just used uh, the company uh, to move. 
Yeah. And then there's also sing posts. Yeah, right? there's another yeah. one, sing posts. I think um I I know a few people who have used that. So um I think one their their biggest box is about twenty kilograms. So for this kind of move, it's based on the weight. So James mentioned earlier about the volume the the volume. <laughs> yeah. And so for this, it's a it's based on the weight. And I think about like um twenty kilograms is about. Two hundred or four hundred dollars, I yeah. think. So you can check the sync post. Yeah. Actually, for sync post, I'm 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 certain that it's also dimensions as well because I wanted to try and move my gaming chair, dismantle gaming chair, through sync post. Now, in terms of weight, it was fine, but the box dimensions right. didn't match. Right. right, I remember that. So it was both the dimensions and the weight. Now, mm -hmm. I, if I if I remember correctly, for weight. Um, it was still okay as long as the dimensions were okay, but you would pay more. But because my box, the shape was so out of their, their, their standard that they just said no. They didn't even give me the option to pay more. They just said no. One thing we will say though, so we easily saved very close to half of the regular shipping fees to move it, move our stuff from Singapore. Um, it did take a long time to reach us. Now, I, I can't say for sure whether if we had used SingPost in Singapore or if we had used the International Mover, whether it would have taken that long, but it took about three months. Three months. About we, three were, months. <laughs> we were told it were like, what, six weeks? Yeah. Yeah. We were, so. yeah we were told it was going to take six weeks. It took three months. Yeah. But that's fine. When it, when it arrived, everything was fine. Everything was fine. Yeah. yeah. And I think also at that time is that there were some delays because of um because of covid yep. and but i think um one thing that uh based from our experience uh, what i can say is that when it comes to bringing stuff over if you don't really need them for example like kitchen kitchen equipment or uh winter clothes i think it's better to buy here that's a good point <laughs> it's uh, better to buy here yeah. instead of paying dollars for a shipping don't get the idea that you're saving money bringing stuff over if you're bringing stuff over it's probably got sentimental value or you don't have a choice otherwise yeah. it's probably cheaper to get it here all right so the next question i'm probably going to leave it to, to g to answer but although yeah i think we both can answer um is taking the student route easier than um, normal PR route through express entry. Now, before uh, I'll give G the answer. So for those of you who don't know, yes, we took the study route here, which means G applied uh, to study in the University of Calgary, uh, got accepted, and then we moved over. So I'm on an open work permit. All right. So yeah, what do you think? Which one's easier? Um, I think it really depends on a lot of factors. If um, you're pretty young and your um, points in the express entry is quite high, like 450, 460. I mean, you could check like what the recent points are in the in the recent draw, and you're confident that you could be drawn um, because of your points, then it is definitely easier to go the express entry route because it only takes a few months. But for people who are not confident with their points in the express entry, I think going through the study route gives a lot of advantages too. And one of that is you can gain um, Canadian academic credentials. So that will help you a lot when you apply and join the job market. Another thing also is while studying, you could work part-time. So you could gain um, Canadian work experience. And while you're studying, I mean, if you have a spouse, um, your spouse could apply for open work permit and um, could, could work and could support you and also gain work experience that will help you when you apply for PR. There are also a lot of things that you need to consider. One of it is finances, because um, especially if you couldn't get a scholarship, I mean, you could always apply. Um, there are a lot of scholarships available for international students, but if you couldn't get a scholarship, you will have to pay for tuition fee. And that would depend on the university that you're going to going to attend or the college that you're going to attend. For my university, for my program, if I don't get a scholarship every year, I think the the tuition fee costs about twelve, I think about twelve thousand plus. Also, you have to consider your living expenses, your day-to-day -day expenses. So you have to take note of finances when you have to go through the study route. So yeah, a few other things as well I think we, we need to mention. Number one, um, going the study route is not a PR. Mm -hmm. It's a student permit. 
And if you're coming with uh, a spouse, it's an open work permit. Now, after that, you still have to apply for permanent residency. So don't forget that it doesn't mean that if you uh, go through the study route and by the time you graduate, you'll graduate with a PR. No, it doesn't work that way. All right. Now, the other thing is, now I know some people, actually a lot of people aren't really comfortable um, doing the entire process of the express entry application by themselves, you know. So they will go to a um, immigration agency, which if you look at costs, doesn't really matter where you are, you're looking at the thousands, all right? And if let's say you were to go through the study route, from what we've experienced, it's a lot easier than the regular permanent residency route in terms of the number of stuff they have to do, like logistics and all mm -hmm. that. So you can look at it another way where you can take the study route uh, and pay that amount for your fees if you don't get a scholarship or you apply for a PR, pay probably the same amount to the immigration agency get nothing back in return and it's still not a, a, a confirmed thing that you will get your PR. So remember that. Yeah, so I think the main thing I would say is if you're trying to decide you're on the fence whether to take the study route or you know go through the normal express entry route, no matter what it is, always check your CRS score, what points you could possibly get, all right? Uh, and always try to make sure that you are aware or informed of what the minimum score is for each draw, all right? Now, even if you meet that uh, draw, it still doesn't mean that you would get in. It's a huge pool of people and then the government or the immigration agency picks a pool within that score and above, all right? So even if you meet that or you just meet that score, it doesn't mean that you will definitely get in. It might take a long time and your express entry profile lasts only a year and after which you have to reapply again, all right? The other thing is now there are a lot of immigration agencies, especially in, in our region, Southeast mm -hmm, Asia, mm -hmm. where they make a lot of promises that are basically yeah. inaccurate. They tell you, oh, you know, you can definitely get in. They basically just want you to pay because they don't offer that many refunds. Um, if it doesn't go through, right? So that's one thing that you can sort of circumvent if you go through the study route. But again, don't forget, your study route doesn't uh, end in a PR. You still have to go through that process. But because you're already here, you've got Canadian um, studying experience. If your spouse gets a job, he's got Canadian work experience, it definitely helps. Um, okay, next, let's go to the next question. Now, if, so the this question is if I take the study route, does it matter how long the course is? And the simple answer is yes, it does matter. Um, there was something about something called PGWP, right? Maybe yes. you can explain that. So yeah. when, you, when you study, um, after that, you will get a post-graduation work permit if your program is eligible for that. So take note of that. Not all programs, not all universities are eligible to give graduates um, an opportunity to apply for a post-graduation work permit. So a post-graduation work permit, if you are taking, I think, one year worth of a degree program, you will get one year also of post-graduation work permit. If you're taking two years, so like what I'm doing, you will get three years of post-graduation work permit. Now, is that enough to apply, you know, does is that enough time for you to get a PR afterwards? I think it will really depend. So there are um, people who knows that they have higher chances of getting PR. So for example, certain industries, um, like IT, for example, whom we know that um, are very in demand. So I know of some people who only take one year of study because they are confident that their program with their skills, they could get hired right away and wouldn't have any issue mm -hmm of getting a post-graduation work permit and get, getting a PR afterwards. But if you are like me, <laughs> like us, <laughs> who are um, who wants to have more time, um, I, we would suggest to get like a two-year degree so that you can get three years of post-graduation work permit. And with that three years, let's assume that you would spend one year or more than one year working. After that, you can apply for different PR routes. Yeah, but for us, basically, G took the, the study route. She took the uh, master's degree. Now, whether, whether the same thing applies in terms of the duration of the PGWP, whether that applies for like a regular cert or a diploma, I'm not entirely sure um so again you should do your research uh, if i find out the answer to that by the time i'm editing this video I'll, I'll i'll put it here oh one thing i wanted to mention actually in the to answer the previous question um 
where you apply also matters. Uh, even if you decide to go to the study route, we, we know friends who have applied for schools in Ontario and they got rejected twice or I think even three times, you know. So um, knowing how reputable the school is, what courses they offer also matters. Remember that. Okay, so for the next question, I think I'll answer this one, uh, which was basically how did we get nominated by the province of Alberta? So when you apply for PR, obviously you have to create your express entry profile. Now, once you create your express entry profile, you can go one step further and gain nomination by a certain province. All right. So when you create your express entry profile, you can state like which province you want to move to. For us, we were pretty certain we wanted to move to Alberta, specifically Calgary. Um, so we wanted to get a nomination by uh, the province of Alberta. Now, why is that so important? Now, we all know you get points in your express entry score, right? Now, getting nominated by a province is basically a shoe-in uh, for the next draw, and you definitely get it. Uh, and that's how we got it, because it gives you 600 additional points on top of whatever score you already have, you know? So from getting like 420... It jumped to 1,020 and we got that nomination two days before the next draw and we got in. It, basically, once you get nominated, it is a shoe in. The only reason why you wouldn't get it is maybe an issue with documentation. But so far, anyone that I've spoken to, uh, once you get nominated, it's a shoe in. You're in for the next draw. So how did we get nominated? Now, basically, um, for me, I work in the, in the IT uh, industry um, and... Actually, earlier this year, somewhere in January, so Alberta released a new pathway to get nominated by uh, the province of Alberta. So specifically, it's called the Accelerated um, Tech Pathway. So this pathway um, is actually targeted towards IT professionals working in the province of Alberta. So either you have an offer uh, from a tech company uh, in Alberta or you are already working in one then you qualify for this. So it was basically almost tailor-made for me. <laughs> yeah. So if you were given, if let's say you're not even in Canada yet and you've received an offer uh, by a tech company, and when I say tech company, there is a specific list yes. uh, of what the company does. So every company has a IACS, I think that's the score. Oh, sorry, IAS classification. So if you have... Um, uh, a job offer from a company that is in that IACS and in the same, um, uh, what you call it, classification, uh, or you're already working in one. Now, one thing I, I do want to make uh, clear is that if you are working for a tech company uh, that's accepted, it's got a proper IACS classification and all that, what you are working as also matters. You, you need to be a tech professional. So, so let's say, for example, you're working for a software company, Alberta, but you're in HR. No, that doesn't count. You must fall under a certain classification of what we call not codes, right? So that is uh, national occupancy. National yeah. occupational classification. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so next question, um, not so much with immigration. So <laughs> this one is interesting. Is it easy or is, it's okay? These are two common questions. So I'm going to compile them into one. So is it easy to get Asian groceries and are they more expensive? Now, I was very surprised, like we mentioned earlier, yes. right? Yeah. Yes and yes. Yeah. <laughs> and okay, I know G mentioned that it was quite easy to get Singaporean ingredients. Actually, I'm going to disagree slightly. Um, the oh. couple, okay, if you're if you are coming in <laughs> from, let's say, uh, Malaysia or Singapore, okay? Two things I want you to know. <laughs> Number one, it is impossible to get fresh chilies for some weird reason, okay? Number two, even the dried chilies that you get are not like the ones in Singapore and Malaysia. Um, they're from China. Uh, they taste kind of different. Even like the ratio of like like the chili to the seeds is all off. So it's, it's not the same. Um, certain other things like candle nut. Um, even there's a, a specific sauce that I love called red dead sauce, which I use a lot in my cooking. Uh, it's impossible to find it. Doesn't matter where you, where you go. But in general, in general, yes, it is easy. <laughs> in fact, there is a okay. If you're coming in from Vietnam. If you're coming in from the Philippines, if you're coming in from Indonesia, uh, India, obviously, China, any of these places, you, almost everything that you can get you uh, back home, you can get it here. Now, in terms of cost, I can say for Singapore and Philippines, um, generally... Definitely, it's more... Um, yeah. The Asian food, yes, it's more expensive. It's Asian more, groceries, Asian generally, Asian groceries yeah. is more expensive. Certain things course. might actually be around the same price. We've noticed some things where um, price isn't too bad at, at all, you know? 
um, some dry goods that we found, if, if my memory serves me right, actually pretty much cost the same yeah. as, as Singapore. So probably when it comes to pork, price mm. is relatively the same. When it comes to seafood, oh Ooh. my goodness. Prawns are so expensive here. In Singapore, it's about, what, $12 per kilo? Here, $12 per pound. So that's about half that's kilo. Basically, yeah, double the price. Yeah. yeah but vegetables. Vegetables are quite the same. I mean, they're more expensive, but in terms of packaging, there there's <laughs> more in there. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah so yeah. it's it's almost the same. Oh, but um, one thing, um, Calgary is not a coastal city. So that could also be why... Um, seafood, seafood is ex expensive in general, so not specific to Asian groceries. Um, but anyway, yeah, so uh, next question. So what was the biggest adjustment for you in Canada? I think we'll get two different answers. So I'll let G answer that first. So again, what was the biggest adjustment for you? I couldn't think of a very big adjustment right now because um, adjusting here was quite easy for us. Um, I was expecting that the weather would be a big problem because in Singapore, um, I get cold very easily. And even here, I get cold very easily. But so, so I was, we were expecting that during winter, you know, we'll have a terrible time. But I think the mental preparation and the actual preparation helped a lot because mentally we will prepare that, oh, negative 20, negative 30 is going to be so cold. You know, we don't know what's that's going to be our house that's going to feel like. Um, so we brought, we, pre we have like very thick coats. We brought, uh, we bought mittens. We bought like proper boots. And when winter came, for sure, it was cold. Like when it's minus 20 or minus 30, when you go out, you can't go out just with this. You have to put on like all the different layers and you could feel probably in one to, you know, within the <laughs> next five seconds that, you'd feel the difference um, in the temperature. But it's not like that every day. There are weeks when the temperature will really be as low as minus 20, minus 30, but it's not every day. And when you have your proper, when you're properly dressed, it's actually very nice. Winter is very nice because of the snow and it's sunny and it's so nice to walk outside and, you know, play with the snow. So yeah, so what, we were expecting as the biggest adjustment for me particularly was okay. <laughs> it was okay. Yeah, I think for, for me, the, I have a few. Uh, one is definitely the cold. Like for me, personally, I like the cold. But when I say I like the cold, I like how it can get cold in Singapore with an air conditioner. Never experienced this sort of, of temperatures before. I've never experienced winter in my life. So this was the first. Um, but yeah, honestly, um, it wasn't as bad in fact it wasn't bad at yeah. all i mean anything below minus 20 yes you will feel it like for us uh certain parks we went to when it was like minus 27 felt like minus 31 um within five minutes walking around ice was forming in our our mask and our, our clothes as well but as long as you are properly dressed as long as you've got the right um outfits you're actually fine it, it's quite a nice experience and the nice thing about Calgary is that it's so sunny. It's yeah. extremely sunny. So even if it's minus 10, minus 15, when you got the sun on your face, it doesn't feel, it surprisingly doesn't feel as cold. Yeah. 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 The other thing, and I'm sure G is also thinking about it, but she forgot to mention, yeah, is I static think. electricity. <laughs> so let me just explain. So in Singapore, it's really humid. Most of Southeast Asia is pretty humid. So our body is used to discharging electricity uh, quite easily because of those humid conditions. But when it's really dry here, you get zapped <laughs> <laughs> every few seconds. And it's we've been here for eight, nine months now, and we're still not used to it. G is terrified. She's even terrified. I'm traumatized. To, <laughs> even to open the door, she uses like my pants is hanging to cover and, and open the door. And there was one time I actually um, reached out my hand to open and I touched the doorknob and I could actually see the spark between my finger and the doorknob. Now, this doesn't apply to everyone. I know people who moved here and they're like, no, I never experienced mm -hmm. it. Never never had any static uh, electric shock. So, we don't know. It might affect you. It might not. Yeah. Um, 
I know I personally thought one of the biggest adjustments for me would be food. And it turned out to be quite the opposite. We've cooked so much of our local food that we've normally had here. Like G mentioned, Filipino food is so easy to come by. Uh, Vietnamese food is so easy. Uh, we've made pho. We've made all sorts. Of, if you're watching from Singapore, I've made chicken rice. I've made all sorts of local food. I made char siu, siu bar, all that. No issue at all. Basically, everything that you need to get, you can get it here apart from the chilies that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. But the adjustment has been next to nothing and honestly we are in a, a city that is so-called less popular than others so i would imagine if you had moved to ontario or bc <clears throat> a lot of stuff might even be more accessible mm -hmm. but yeah the adjustment was totally fine and of course being from singapore and and g living in singapore for 10 years uh, i come from an english-speaking nation so language wasn't a barrier for me yeah. Yeah. i remember now one of the biggest adjustments <laughs> in terms of weather was not the cold it's the heat <laughs> <laughs> and it's a bit surprising probably you would be wondering why we would complain and like why would we adjust to the heat well for some context we came in june and that was early summer last year summer in calgary and in canada apparently was very bad it was like a record-breaking summer in terms of heat um, and there were also a lot of forest fires. Oh, and duration as well. It was also the longest summer, yeah. Yeah, because usually, apparently, like, you will get, like, very hot weathers on average about five days a year. But last year, like, we would get it, like, months. consecutively, <laughs> yeah, in months. And it was 38, yeah, 40 degrees 38, yeah. kind of weather. And the difference is, and this is a bit funny, because we learned that um, we didn't have aircon because <laughs> in, in the Philippines or in Singapore, in the Philippines, when it's hot, you turn on the fan. Um, and because of humidity, some, somehow it helps. In Singapore, when it's hot, or which is most of the time, well, bus is cold. Buildings are cold. Um, in your house, you can turn on the fan, you can turn on the aircon at night and have a good night's sleep. But here, you don't have air conditioning and it's dry. No, so, we didn't have. Not that it doesn't exist. Oh, we yes, didn't have. <laughs> but most of the houses do not have air conditioning. So at night, we couldn't sleep well. When you lie down on the bed, it's like you're... It's like uh, there's the heat fire. Just gets trapped. And, yeah. yeah, so that's one of our biggest adjustments, I think, the yeah. heat in the summer. But we are prepared. We bought a portable <laughs> air conditioner. We're not allowed to have a proper air conditioner. So we bought a, a portable air conditioning uh, unit. So hopefully this summer is a bit better. I, I know this portable air conditioners aren't that great, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, all right. So next one, uh, we have two more questions. So next one is, how much money should I save before moving to Canada? And that honestly is a pretty loaded question. Um, first of all, it kind of depends on, on, on what you do. I, I don't know if that's the it right depends, thing to say. Yeah, yeah. It, it depends on your lifestyle also or, <laughs> um, or how much you can save. No, but I think it really depends on the kind of lifestyle that you have and you want to maintain when you're here in Canada. Yeah. But in terms of like um, the minimum or the, the, the government has a recommendation of how much money you should be having before coming here. And they also have recommendations on how much, like when it's just you, when you're coming with your family, when you're coming with your kids. So you can search um, the government website in terms of like actually it's not even much. a recommendation it's a mandate you, you right, need to have right. that amount yeah. so if you're coming alone it's a certain amount uh if you're coming with a spouse it's a certain amount I, i'm gonna i'm gonna list them here um but yeah so you do need so it, the question is kind of twofold like how much do you need to qualify there's a certain amount mm -hmm. how much do you need do you think you need to survive that's a loaded question depending on what kind of lifestyle you're expecting mm -hmm. uh, one thing you need to know depending on where you go to like for example calgary you generally need a vehicle, you know. Uh, there is public transport. It runs smoothly. It's generally pretty clean. Um, but then there are issues like duration. They are not as um, well efficiently planned as like Singapore and all that. So one example I can give you is that for me, um, we, I, we bought our car about two weeks after I got my job. All right. So for the first two weeks, um, I was taking public transport. Uh, we lived in a, we live in northwest of Calgary. My office is in the southeast, so the opposite side diagonally. Um, when I got the car and I drove to work, it's about 20, 25 minutes. 
when I had to take public transport, it was two hours, right? So it's not an issue of them not, not running on time or not coming on time. It's more of an issue with that they are not efficiently planned to go everywhere because a lot of people have cars. It doesn't make sense for you know the, the gov government to make a super efficient sort of public transport system. So generally, you can if you wanted to uh, yeah. kind of survive without, but it's very difficult. And I think, yeah, it, it really depends also on what um, what you're used to. Because, for example, like what James said, like if you compare it with Singapore, then um, the public transport system here will really fare very bad. <laughs> but for example, if you're uh, a commuter in Manila, oh yeah, who's used to traffic. So for example, when I was working in Manila, I stayed in Cubao and I work in Pasay. Um, I would wake up at what six six thirty, leave home around seven thirty, and reach Pasay at nine thirty. So that's two hours. So that's every day. And the difference also is that in, in, in Manila, like you would ride a Jeep, you, you know, you would ride the LRT very, um, and, and, you know, you would shove your way through the MRT crowd. I mean, Filipinos, people in Manila would know what I'm talking about. So you won't experience that here. So public, so if you compare it with Manila, public transport system here is still better than what we have there. So, um, yeah, so it really depends. Um, it's okay. <clears throat> Another thing is you're not going to get any EDSA jams here. No. Okay. <laughs> you do have heavy traffic. You do have uh, jams occasionally maybe caused by an accident, but generally even during the peak period, traffic is okay. There's probably one highway, Deerfoot, the Deerfoot uh, trail where, you know, during peak period, it can get pretty jammed. But other than that, it's totally fine. Okay, and I think I have to explain what we mean by jam. When it's jam, it just means that the vehicles couldn't <laughs> move like 80, 80 kilometers per hour, but it's moving. You are not stopping. Yeah. You know, you only stop when the traffic light is on red, but when it's jam, it just means that you move slowly, but you still move. Yeah. So, but going back to the question in terms of how much money. Um, in terms of groceries, and we're going to do a, a, another video talking more specific about how much we spend, how much are the general stuff. So if you want to, if you have a question like, how much does this cost in Calgary? Let us know. We'll do a more detailed video on that. But generally, I feel like we're spending about 400 on groceries. Four, four, six, eight. And we are not being very efficient with our money. I will admit, <laughs> we can be a lot more efficient with our money. Um, for me, I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to eat the same stuff every day. So uh, I'm I'm a little spoiled that way, I guess. So you could definitely spend a lot less uh, in terms of that. So you one thing. So going back to the question, I would say is think about how much you need to survive for at least a year. If you're talking about you have a spouse coming and you need to uh, look for a job, I was extremely lucky to get a job in the first three months. Not everyone is that lucky. Some people take six months. I know people who've taken a year to get a job. So think about how much you would need to survive, like maybe a year just to be safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's the kind of number you should be looking at. Yeah. <coughs> and, and probably um, we know that there's a lot of interest for this kind of information. So like how much do you have to pay for rent? How much do you need for groceries? How much do you need to survive for a month in general? So probably we'll, we'll make another yeah. video um, on that. Yeah. We, I mean, we, we need ideas as well. Let us know what kind of videos you want us to do. We're happy to do that. Um, so we'll come to the last question, which is sort of connected to the previous question. Uh, and this was asked to me a few times, actually, uh, even by some friends. So was it difficult to convert my driver's license? Um, and was it difficult or is it really expensive to buy a car? So um, first, we'll address the driver's license. So if you're coming here for a short period of time, I think it's like two or three months, uh, you can just apply for something called an international driving permit. All right. So that allows you to drive. I believe it's three months. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and you don't need to convert your license to an Alberta license or a Canadian one at that. Um, if you're here for the long term and you want to uh, convert it to a Canadian license, now um, Canada has what they call a reciprocal license exchange uh, agreement with certain countries. And again, I'll, I'll put it somewhere here, I think, all the countries that qualify. So if you're coming in from this country, it's really easy. Just do a swap with your license. Now, Singapore, unfortunately, doesn't have this sort of agreement. I think the main reason for that is because in Singapore, we drive on the other side of the road. <laughs> Steering wheel is on the other side. Um, so I had to go through the process. So what I had to do was first, I had to take a theory test. Pretty straightforward. Um, 
you, you can you can download a PDF for that. It's basically if if you have driving experience, it's pretty easy. It's just understanding the laws uh, here, and they are always specific to the province. So remember that, all right? Um, after that, you take what we kind of like a basic test. So it's called a GDL seven license. Okay, so once you get that license by right. Um, you have to keep that license for a year and they have, and it's very restrictive in terms of how you can drive. First, you need someone with a, a full license with you in the car or else you can't drive. Uh, you can only drive certain times of the day as well. I'm not going to give too much details. Go on the website. You can check it out pretty, you can find out pretty easily. Um, and after a year, then you can apply for the GDL7 full license. All right. Now, because I've got past experience, I actually applied for a GDL7 exemption, okay? Uh, so I had to submit documents, and once I did that, uh, it allowed me to bypass that whole year and go straight to the full license, which is called a GDL5 license, or not even GDL, just a class five, all right? So that one basically removes all the restrictions. Uh, and so I did that, and I think throughout the whole process, I got my license in about a month, I believe. Um, I chose to take some lessons, just like sort of refresher, because back in Singapore, I haven't driven for a few years. I sold my car a long time ago. And also because driving on the other side of the road, and plus, compared to Singapore, there are a lot more road signs here, a lot more specific signs uh, compared to Singapore. So I really wanted to understand. I wanted to drive around and get used to it before the test. So for me, it took about a month. For some of you, it might be a bit shorter. And next one about the car. So again, whether it's expensive depends on where you're coming from. If you're in Singapore, you're already in the country <laughs> with the most expensive cars in the world. So yes, it's going to be cheaper. <laughs> um, for us, we got a car. We got a 2014 Nissan Murano. We, we got it for about 13,000, uh, which is actually quite high if you, if you compare to what car prices generally are uh, in Canada. And that's because... Uh, you know, COVID affects everything. So COVID affected a, 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 a logistics issue uh, when it came to shipping in cars. So if you wanted to buy a brand new car, there were waiting lists that were like 12 to, to 16 or 18 months to get a brand new car. Um, and that affects the used market as well, you know? So cars, the prices were going up. In fact, when we started car hunting, like one day I was shortlist six cars. The next day I checked, it's almost gone. all were sold, you know? So they were hot ticket items. People were buying. So we, we didn't waste any time. We went and bought a car uh, immediately. Now, one thing I will say is if you just come into Canada, regardless of which province and all that, it is very hard, almost impossible to get an auto loan. Okay? So there are some um, dealerships that would offer you a loan, uh, even if you've got no, no credit score, if you just came in and all that. My general, my general recommendation, as much as possible, don't take up those loans because the interest rates are through the roof. They are very, very bad. And it's, it's basically predatory loans that they offer to you. So um, actually going back to the previous question, how much would you want to save? Try and take that into account as well. You know, you can get some really cheap cars for like four or 5,000. They don't run that well. They're cheap Honda cars or whatever. Uh, if you're okay with that, that's fine. Uh, but just note that driving in winter, you have to be a bit careful. But we decided to be safe and we bought an SUV. Yeah. And another thing also, I think is both of us do not know very much about cars, like in terms of quality. So in terms of like, buying secondhand cars we don't know how to check whether what like yeah. transmission is good or well, whatever yeah if yeah. it was singapore i would know but yeah. here your conditions are different i didn't know what to to look out for so i wasn't entirely sure singapore it's very easy here you got winter you got fall so there are other things you need to check so yeah. so so that's why we opted to go for a a Japanese brand and a brand that we quite know. Um, but if you are someone who knows about cars and who know people also who could help you check whether what you're buying is of good quality, then um yeah, there are other options like you could buy from Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji where you have to deal with the seller with the owner of the car directly. And sometimes it's, most of the time, it's cheaper than buying from a dealership, a dealership yeah. which we did. We, we, we bought from a dealership. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so you could get a cheaper car. If I were to give a generalized answer, I would say the cheapest car that would be worth buying generally be about four or $5,000. 
Uh, so take that into account if you want to think about cost as well. Yeah, so that's all the questions that we have. And we hope that we have helped you with some of the information. And and please know that's based on our experience. We're not experts, but we've learned a lot from other people's experiences as well. So we hope that by doing this, we could help you also. Um, if you have other questions, you can send us those. Um, continue sending us those and we could compile and make another video. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching and see you in our next video. Bye. Bye.